In this season of creation, we address the theme of good news for creation. We explore the earth readings from Mountain Sunday to discover the way God loves us and renews creation and the ways in which God invites us into relation with the natural world for the benefit of creation. I wrote in the e-news this week about the place of mountains in the consciousness of New Zealanders. The place I grew up, Timaru, on the east coast of the South Island of New Zealand, is a coastal plain, but soaring above the plain to the west are the foothills of the southern Alps, and you don't have to travel far to see the Alps themselves. The high country inland from Timaru and the region of central Otago are my sacred mountain places. So this morning I invite you to think about your sacred mountain spaces. I think I've yet to see much of the mountainscapes of Australia, but I do know that the mountains here are unique. The strange glasshouse mountains in Queensland, the peaks of Tasmania and the snowy mountains, the ancient escarpment of the Blue Mountains, so significant to Sydney's Siders, and the sacred heart of Australia in Uluru. Mountains have held a sense of mystery for human beings since ancient times. People have spoken of being in the presence of God while on mountains and having a sense of the mystery of life. Many of us know the words from Psalm 121, I will lift mine eyes unto the hills, from whence cometh my help. This is one of the times that lack of biblical punctuation is problematic. Many have assumed that it means that our help comes from the hills. But the psalmist is actually saying, I look up to the hills, where is my help going to come from? Help comes not from the hills, but from the Holy God. However, it is almost naturally that we humans look, look up, look to the hills, to the mountains, to find sacred moments and sacred spaces. Frequently in the Bible, prophets had visions on mountaintops of an ideal future, a world where the turmoil of war would cease, a world where the dreams of God would be realized, a world where God would create peace and harmony throughout all creation. One such period in biblical history was when the people of God returned from the exile to Babylon and found a land suffering from generations of foreign domination. Over the years, the land had been abused and exploited by foreign peoples. And the city of Zion, the mountain where their God once dwelled in splendor, was a shambles. In that context, the people faced the harsh reality that life in their land would be difficult, the future would be uncertain, the land itself would be infertile, and the God they knew less than the mighty one who had liberated them from Egypt in the past. This reality also included the people who had been left behind in Judah, who didn't go into exile, but who nevertheless seemed to be abandoned by their God. The prophet Ezekiel had said that God left the land and went into exile with the Israelites. Now the returned exiles and the abandoned ones face a bleak future together. The opening lines of our reading from Isaiah speak of God creating a new heaven and a new earth. The verb for create is the same here as it is in Genesis chapter 1. Creation continues in the present and the future. God did not create the world a long time ago and then retire. Here the prophet announces another of God's continuing creations. The expressions new heavens and a new earth could just as easily be translated new skies and new land. The prophet is talking about the physical world not some distant dream world or spiritual world. The word world envisioned by the prophet includes everyday houses, vineyards and vegetable gardens. The new creation is a transformation of this, of this creation by removing the curses that have plagued the people. And this transformed world will also be a blessing for human beings. They will not die young. They will live long and enjoy the labour of their hands rather than being ripped off and oppressed. They will be blessed as will their descendants be. This vision is both of economic justice and harmony with creation. And yet so often in the spirit of capitalism, economic prosperity is pitted against care of creation. 
but especially when we make decisions about mining and water use. And yet this text is telling us that economic justice and harmony with creation can and will go together. The passage from Isaiah links the mountain and a vision of peace. The transformation of the world will happen, we are told, on God's holy mountain. The promise of God is that Jerusalem, also known as Mount Zion, is still the place from which God's creative power and renewing presence emanates. So we are told that Jerusalem will become a city of joy, a place of happiness in the way that I spoke to the, in the children's story. But that joy will not just be confined to the people. It is God who will rejoice in the holy mountain, together with the people of God who worship in that mountain. And ultimately there is a sense that the mountain will celebrate too. This is a very far cry from the reality of Jerusalem, of Israel and Palestine in our time. Yet the vision calls us on to a future hope, a hope of peace. The final image evokes the Advent reading that we're familiar with in Isaiah 11, where the wolf and the lamb live together. In both passages, wild creatures live at peace with weaker creatures. Lions and oxen are found eating straw, and the snake eats dust, not live animals. Many mountains in our time have been exploited and polluted by human beings. One terrible example of this is the Freeport Mines located <coughs> in the Indonesian highlands of occupied West Papua in the heartland of the Angmomi people. It is one of the largest mines in the world. From these mines have flowed tailings that are full of toxins, sediment, that have polluted rivers, wildlife and vegetation and destroyed human communities. The Among Me people consist of a population of about 13,000. Under Dutch colonisation, they lived in 17 valleys on the southern flanks of the central mountain plateau. They were hunter-gatherers who had rotating gardens and they were so totally self-sufficient. Now many Among Me people live in diaspora, driven off their sacred land and mountains. The extraction of enormous amounts of copper, gold and other metals has destroyed the, la the landscape and protests against the appropriation and destruction of lands have, led, have often been brutally repressed by the Indonesian military. From this mountain and many others, poisonous power rather than rich renewal has flowed. Mining activities have turned the mountain into a symbol of human greed and destruction. At first glance, it might seem strange that the curators of the season of creation have paired that Isaiah reading and the reality of the pain of mountains that are destroyed with Mark's version of Jesus' commission to the disciples. It's a lesser well-known version of the, of the Great Commission. In Matthew, Jesus tells the disciples to go and make disciples of all nations. But the commission in Mark has a different emphasis. Here Jesus also tells the disciples to go into the world, but he asks them to proclaim the gospel, the good news about God's love in Christ Jesus to the whole creation. Generally interpreters have just read creation as human beings, but the original word is the physical creation, sun, sky, earth, and all the creatures. The good news of the gospel is not only for humans, but for all creation. The creation, abused and broken by human activity, is also the object of God's love and care. The love of God and Christ extends farther than our personal lives. It reaches to the ends of the earth, to the depths of creation, to the core of the cosmos. And the love that redeems us can also renew creation if we but consent to share in that love and that loving. So let us dwell now with images and music in the blessedness and the brokenness of mountains.